So thrilled to be here with you today. My name is Danielle Goldman. I'm co-founder and CEO of Open Avenues. And I want to start by telling you all a little story about what it was like to grow up with an immigration attorney as a father. So every night at the dinner table, I heard stories about the foreign national scientists, the founders, the engineers, the software developers who were coming to the United States from around the world to go to school here, to build companies here, to add value here, to combat climate change, to cure cancer. And I heard about the challenges of the visa process. And I heard complex cases. And all of you are made up of your own personal histories that make a unique case. And my father was saw every case as a puzzle that was able to be solved. And that is the approach that we took as we built open avenues and decided to innovate within legislation and think about how we could look at the complex H-1B lottery system and the restrictive system that exists today and how we could create and carve out a path for foreign nationals to be able to stay in the United States to build companies here and to continue to work and thrive and contribute. So we're gonna talk today about cap exempt H-1Bs. We're gonna talk about uh, exactly how this process works for anyone who needs a visa and is interested in exploring. I am thrilled to be here today with my father and co-founder, Jeff Goldman. And also with Felix Matusa, who is our fellow, one of our fellows at Open Avenues. So I am going to start with Jeff and we are going to, actually I'm going to start and I wanna give you a brief overview of Open Avenues and our model. Um, all of you or many of you are aware of the H-1B visa. You're aware of the cap of 85,000 you're, you might be aware that this is the most common work visa in the United States, whether you're uh, coming from outside the United States or whether you're on OPT and trying to figure out your next steps or transitioning from another visa category. And you might not know that there are four types of organizations in the United States that qualify as cap exempt, exempt from the H-1B lottery. If you work for one of these four types of organizations, you can always be sponsored for an H-1B, exempt from the lottery cap. And the beauty of this cap exempt H-1B is that if you work part time for one of these cap exempt organizations, then any US employer can sponsor you full time on a cap exempt H-1B. So Open Avenues Foundation is one of these cap-exempt organizations. The four types of cap-exempt organizations are universities, nonprofit research institutions, government research institutions, and nonprofits affiliated with universities. If you work full-time for one of these orgs, awesome. They can sponsor you for a cap-exempt H-1B. You don't have to worry about the lottery. If you work part-time for one of these organizations, your own company, your startup, or your full-time employer like Google or Amazon or, or a small, medium-sized biotech can file full-time cap-exempt H-1B outside of the lottery as long as you stay employed by that cap-exempt entity. So Open Avenues program is a fellowship. We offer part-time employment to individuals five hours per week. You work for us contributing to our university partners, training the future workforce in STEM and in business fields. And once you work for Open Avenues, and we have 100 fellows in the program today across the entire country, and they are, we have a 99% approval rate for our cap-exempt H-1B visas. We've been building this for five years. We know how to get these approved. 
and we are growing quickly. So I'm going to turn this over to our panelists and we're gonna talk about this path and why it exists and what it's like to be in our program. So Jeff, let's start with you. Individuals have many options for visas, founders or, or mid to senior level tech talent. What, why H-1B? When do you choose H-1B and when do you choose cap exempt H-1B? I think the biggest benefit to the H-1B, um, as opposed to other options, is that H-1B permits dual intent, which means if you want to pursue permanent residency or a green card in the United States, you can do it while you're here as a non-immigrant. That would also be true of an L-1 visa, but it's not true of the O-1, E-1, E-2, J-1, all the other ways that people can work here. So that's the biggest benefit to the H-1B. Um, also, E-1, O-1, they're hard to qualify for. Um, H-1B, if you have a degree in a specialized field and you have a job offer in a specialized field that requires that degree, that's really the crux of it. And so it's a bit easier and more straightforward, less stress, because the O-1 and the E's um, you know, they, we do them all the time, but they're difficult and less certain. Um, I think that's the main reason why one would choose H-1B. Cap exempt H-1B, you would choose it because it works, because it's an unbelievable way to be able to stay in the U.S. if you have no other options. Certainly, if we're talking about a cap exempt H-1B, you would want to be sure you don't qualify for O-1 or L-1 or E-2 first because cap exempt H-1Bs are a little bit more complicated and can be rather expensive. So you look, you look at your other options first, but it's a great choice when there are no other options. And while you're building a case for an O-1, often this is a great visa status to be in as you continue to find those opportunities to build yourself into a good candidate for an O-1 or EB-1A. And it's a common misconception that founders cannot sponsor their own H-1B. Can you talk about how, if that's possible and, and how that works, if so? Founders can sponsor themselves for H-1B. The rule is there must be a valid employer-employee relationship. But the United States Citizenship and Immigration, and Immigration Services has said thousands and thousands of times, if you own 50% or less of the company sponsoring you, there is a valid employer-employee relationship. And if you own more than 50%, you can prove that there's a valid employer-employee relationship by proving that the board of directors can fire you and you can't stop it from happening. There's, there's a, several vehicles to make sure that happens, one of which is manipulating the bylaws of the company to make sure that the board has the power to fire you and you cannot remove the board members who might vote to fire you. And that has worked every time. So it, exciting that founders can have their own startup sponsor them for an H-1B. Awesome. And what is the trajectory after H-1B? What, what is possible long term? Because many people are coming here, they're starting companies, but they're thinking of next steps, the whole pathway and how to map that out for themselves. So what does that long-term plan look like if you're on H-1B or cap-exempt H-1B? Uh, H-1B, whether it's because you won the lottery or because you have a cap-exempt H-1B, you get a maximum of six years in three-year increments. After that, you're done unless an employer has started the green card process for you at least a year before the end of your six years. So the timing is really critical. You certainly need to be talking to an employer about starting the green card process as you begin your fourth year. You cannot wait. Um, the, the trajectory is getting a green card. That's what most people want. A green card is permanent residency. Briefly, only a few ways to get a green card. Um, the PERM labor certification process where an employer will sponsor you and prove that you, there is no U.S. worker out there that can do the job. While it sounds daunting, most good immigration lawyers have no problem getting through the process because the rules are so archaic and ridiculous that it's not that hard to 
follow each and every rule and prove that there's no U.S. worker out there. But most people maybe in the room and most people I see every day, because the biggest part of what I do every day is um, extraordinary ability visas and national interest waivers, most people would like to find a way to sponsor the green card without an employer having to be involved. And that is the other way to obtain a green card through um, national interest waiver, proving that what you do is um, clearly benefits the people of the United States and that you're well situated to continue to bring that benefit and that what you bring to the table is more important to the U.S. than worrying about whether there's another U.S. worker out there that could do the job. So that's the path. Um, citizenship, you must be a permanent resident for five years before you're allowed to apply for citizenship. I'm impressed. That was the fastest you've ever done that. Unbelievable. Um, I also realized I forgot to have Jeff introduce himself, but you can look on our website and find his bio there. He's been an immigration attorney for more than 30 years and working with startups out of Y Combinator and uh, is, a, is working with startups at the HBS Rock Center and has been doing this for a very long time. So you can trust what he's saying tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Felix, who is one of our wonderful fellows. And Felix, if you could please start with a brief intro and just tell us a little bit about your immigration journey and how what that's looked like for you in starting a company. Yeah, um, so good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm not as cool as Jeff, but um, I was born and raised in Zimbabwe and I moved to the US in 2014 to attend Princeton University where I studied computer science. During my time there, I did a couple of internships and I used my OPT. I know some of you might be familiar with that. So Princeton doesn't have, didn't have CPT at the time, so I used part of my OPT during my four years. When I graduated, I had an offer to go work at Microsoft, who had already started doing my uh, green card, my H1B process at the time. But um, I thought it would be cool to start a startup. So I joined with two of my friends to start a startup in the crypto space uh, in uh, 2018. And then at the time, our immigration uh, approach was we're just going to work on this startup, it's going to work, and then after that, we're going to get green cards, whatever that means. Uh, unfortunately, we bent through our OPT, like STEM extension, and then our startup crashed. So in early 2020, we shut down the startup. And um, I loved Brex, uh, and I still love them at the time. And uh, they were also cool in terms of like sponsoring my green card in H1B. So I joined to work with them as a software engineer. Uh, I applied for my H1B for the first time in 2020. I didn't get selected. So I had about one year of OPT left. Um, and then we started up doing my green card, going through the, the STEM the PEM process that Jeff alluded to earlier. I think there were some changes by the administration at the time, so it got delayed and we had to redo it again. So by the time my one year of OPT uh, that I had remaining had ended, that was in March of 2021, I didn't have an H1B because we tried the second time, it failed again and my um, green card was nowhere to be found because it had been delayed. So I ended up moving to Canada, was working there for breakfast as software engineer. And the goal was I would move back to the US within like a few months. Uh, unfortunately, it got delayed again because we started doing consular processing, those delays from COVID and all that stuff. And at that time, I started working on a startup with my friend that was the blockchain space again. Um, and I just got in like um, tired of waiting. So I ended up quitting the startup and then exploring different options we had. We looked at um, uh, H1Bs, but it was already in October, so the regular H1B was already passed. We looked at O1, we talked to a few lawyers who got like mixed reviews. So some were like, it's gonna work, some were like, it's not gonna work. So just like we don't like the uncertainty. And then it went, uh, that's when we started Googling around and we found Jeff uh, via the program we ran in Boston a few years prior. And then that linked us to open avenues and I sent a lot of emails, connected with them, and then now I'm here. So the takeaway there is it's complex. Um, and it's a winding road, and everyone has, a, many people, you, you can get lucky and this can be simple for you, and it happens all the time, but for many people, it's a winding road, whether you're coming from abroad or whether you're graduating from a U.S. school. And graduating from Princeton and starting a company, having it flop, going through COVID, it's a lot. Um, but how did you, when you... You know, how did you ultimately land on open avenues and what was that decision making like for you? 
Yeah, so what it did is like, I just started Googling, ran into Jeff's profile and OAF. I also ran into, I think, a Sophie who runs uh, Alcon Immigration. She had done like a profile on TechCrunch where she talked about OAF as well and how successful it has been. So I just went to Alcon and then also became like a member of the Alcon community as well. Um, and then I, when I started learning about Open Avenues, I had to call with Erin and she just explained to me how the process worked. It felt very straightforward. Like you just fill in this template, you fill in what you've done, like your education, your, your transcript and everything, it works. And feels straightforward and that's what we did. Within like eight weeks or so, the process was done. Um, and then uh, working with the students has been super fun. So I work with like, I've done like three programs. So I'm a software engineering fellow. So I work with students to run programs for like six weeks or 12 weeks, depending on summer or during the school year. And I worked about five students at the time, and they've been very, very smart. Like three of them, I was talking to my team with the idea, I was like, we should hire these kids when we start doing internships for our startup. So I'm a co-founder of a startup that does blockchain infra stuff. Uh, so it has been super cool because some of them, it's like their first internship. And I remember what it was for me when I do my first internship. So taking them through like zero to like learning about coding and in a pro professional setting. And then most of them are very, very smart. And that has been fun. Yeah, it's it's meant to be a rewarding process for, for foreign nationals who participate in our fellowship program and to build pipeline for your company. So when companies sign up and nominate a candidate or when your own company signs up with us and nominates a candidate, as Felix is saying, you work five hours a week working with students launching these projects and you're actually training students while accessing pipeline. And so it's built to be a win-win for companies and foreign nationals and the universities and their students. Win-win, win-win-win for universities and students who are also benefiting from access to companies like yours. And Felix, so many people in this room today are navigating both starting a company and navigating the immigration trajectory for themselves. And that's daunting. It's stressful, it's anxiety inducing, and we know that, all of us on stage, and you all know that, but what is, you've been through this, you're in a good spot now, so what is your advice to everybody in the room who is trying to balance this and figure this out? Uh, my number one advice is uh, talk to Jeff and uh, Daniel here. You didn't tell him to say that. <laughs> Um, I think, I think, as everyone say, talk to a lawyer or find lawyers, whatever, but from a practical standpoint, uh, the first thing is you want to minimize the risk. So 95% plus of startup fail for multiple reasons. So you don't want to start up fail because you chose a terrible way for you to try to get a visa and it didn't work. So what I do, try to find a way that's kind of has a high rate of success, right? For example, Daniel here was saying open avenue success rate is 99%. It's pretty much like guaranteed more or less. Besides going H1B, I've tried it five times in different companies and it didn't work. So try to do stuff that's like high chance of success. The, first one, the second one is kind of put your ego aside. Um, I have a lot of friends who have gone to uh, very good universities, they've done very good programs, whatever, and they have the notion that I need to get an O1 because like the instant visa or whatever. Um, and or they want to be the CEO of a company, all right, for them to look cool on LinkedIn or whatever that means. Or they want to get like 80% of the company because I come up with the idea or whatever that means. So what you need to do, put your ego aside and try to find what is the thing you need to do to make your company success. And going off what Jeff said, for you to go like a uh, cap examination, you need to prove that you are fireable. And that means you need to go outside your own way for them to do that work. And the last thing I would say is uh, just try to be res uh, resourceful. Like I, when I learned about Jeff, I harassed him on LinkedIn. I sent like three emails or something like that via LinkedIn. Same thing with Danielle and Aaron and Rua, somewhere there. I think I sent like 20 or so different messages people were part of the Open Avenues Foundation to get it work. I emailed Sophie and Alcon Law and I harassed them with three different emails between people because I knew that was the only way to get it. So sometimes people don't respond to you on time. It doesn't mean that they don't want to hear from you. It just means they're busy. But what you need to do is just, you know what you want, go get what you want. And um, yeah, that's what I would say. We do respond. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. I promise we have better intake systems now than we've ever had. So you will get a response from us. I they do, they do. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you both. And I just want to briefly talk about the future of Open Avenues because what we've talked about here tonight is the fact that this is working, it's available to you, it's an awesome solution, and nothing in the immigration world is guaranteed. But we do have data to show you that this works. And we are now launching a new national program called the Build Fellowship. We will be launching this with universities and nonprofits across the United States, and it will be open for foreign nationals to apply for and for foreign national founders to apply for or mid to senior level talent. And we are going to be building the future workforce of foreign nationals and the future workforce of Americans who are going to learn from all of our foreign national build fellows. So we are very excited for this next chapter. We're excited to be here and to meet all of you and connect with all of you. And please stay in touch with us. We're very active on LinkedIn. You can find us on our materials that we've handed out today. And good luck on your individual journeys. And we're here for you if you need us. Thank you, everyone.